Thank you. Um, so as, uh, as she said, my name is Austin McBride, and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, cryptocurrency, uh, how it's a gold mine, uh, and how you can protect a couple of measures you can do to protect your environment. So uh, first we'll talk a little bit about cryptocurrency in general, uh, and then cryptojacking, then phishing, and then a little bit uh, about alternate coins uh, and exchanges, and then finally about measures to protect yourself. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, one, I got a haircut, um, so I look a little different now. Um, but I am a threat analytics researcher at uh, Cisco Umbrella. I have a BS in uh, data mining and economics. Uh, I really love crypto. Uh, my hobbies are working and uh, basically algorithmic uh, crypto trading. And of course, work. So a little bit about the team that I work with. Uh, it's called Cisco Umbrella. And uh, we basically mix data science and uh, network security. Uh, and so we call that uh, big security data. Uh, we process about 180 billion DNS queries um, a day. And that's roughly a little bit less than 3% of daily uh, DNS traffic globally. Um, so we get uh, quite a, a decent sample uh, as far as DNS queries are concerned. Uh, we also um, see a lot of new domains that have never, that have just been registered and have not really uh, been visited frequently. And uh, now that we're a part of Cisco, um, before we were open DNS, um, now we have all of Cisco's data as well. So daily activities for myself and other people on my team are uh, security analysis, distributed systems, uh, big data engineering, and data visualization. So a little bit about cryptocurrency. Um, so as we all know, cryptocurrency had a pretty meteoric rise. Um, it, it's not quite there at the moment. It's about 200 billion, but uh, within a one-year period, we went from 26 billion in market cap all the way to 835 billion, um, which is not something that we've ever really seen in other traditional markets. Uh, so, so with this, um, there's a lot of opportunity, right, uh, for anybody to make money, and especially uh, malicious actors. So with the going mainstream and becoming more popular, a lot of uh, individuals are going to get into this space and it's going to be a ripe um, spot for malicious actors to go and take advantage of people who don't know much about blockchain or uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, it is under-regulated uh, and it's highly volatile and there are a lot of malicious actors that are wanting to steal your funds. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, cryptocurrency regulation. Um, so to start off with, I think uh, Japan has the most uh, comprehensive structure uh, at the moment for regulating, uh, especially exchanges uh, in, in your country. And I think it's great. I would say that most other countries are not anywhere near um, the understanding of, of blockchain or exactly how to regulate it, uh, especially with the, the different governing bodies. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, an idea, right? We, we started off with the, the Mt. Gox uh, compromise in 2014. Um, then the FATF, Guidance Risk-Based Approach to Cryptocurrencies in 15, very progressive. Um, then the Payment Services Act in 2017. Um, now everyone goes, a lot of people go through uh, Know Your Customer. Um, everything is complying to anti-money laundering uh, rules. And then there are frequent uh, audits uh, to make sure that the books look okay. Um, then we had CoinCheck, of course, that happened in January. Uh, and then the GVCEA in March of 2018. Um, generally, uh, where there is money, um, there will be malicious actors that uh, want to um, uh, take it from you, right? And uh, in this case, most of it's going to be external. Uh, most of the threats that you'll see that involve cryptocurrencies in your environments are probably not going to come from Japan. Uh, it most likely is going to come from um, Ukraine or another foreign uh, operator that is just operating in your environment as much as possible to, to steal funds. Um, so the reason, one of the reasons that it's actually so attractive is that uh, it's, it's very lucrative and it can be hard to spot if you don't know um, what you're looking for. Uh, crypto exchanges do not necessarily have as robust security measures in place that traditional equity markets do, um, stocks, bonds, you know, et cetera. Uh, and so it's, it's very easy for malicious actors who have uh, an understanding of that to easily um, infiltrate and, and steal funds. Um, it's also very anonymous, uh, depending on the coin, um, and, and with an asset valuation that fluctuates uh, quite a lot. Um, you can basically steal coins in, in two or three days or a week. They can be 30% um, worth 30% more than they were uh, originally. So it's, it's very, very lucrative, and it can be used to 
of course, buy Lamborghinis and things like that, but it can also be used to buy additional malware or infrastructure um, to make even more impact and, and damages. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how cryptojacking fits in uh, to the mix. Um, I, I'm sure you are all very aware, um, but the, the basics of, of crypto mining is basically you're verifying transactions of others, uh, and then you're rewarded um, for verifying those transactions. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, it kind of can differ depending on uh, what coin. Uh, crypto jacking is really just the hijacking of computer resources. Um, and, and there are a few other speakers that talked about this in the conference. Um, and basically, it's just using your GPU, CPU, um, or cloud uh, computing services to, to mine cryptocurrency. Uh, so keeping in mind with the about 180 billion DNS queries we see a day, uh, we've seen a tremendous increase in the amount of uh, crypto traffic um, just in the last um, eight months. And uh, the majority of the traffic is from crypto mining pools. Uh, we see a lot of Monero, of course, um, and some other coins. And uh, they actually happen to affect uh, a lot of different industries. It's not just financial services, uh, healthcare, um, a wide variety of industries all are seeing this type of traffic in their environment. Uh, and there are also some um, malicious actors that are dropping mining software, um, and it persists in your environment as long as it's connected to the internet. Uh, so looking at a, a distribution uh, of, of industry, um, in the U.S. specifically and in Europe, you can see that higher education, uh, energy, and utility companies that typically have um, hardware that is uh, older and not necessarily patched as, as, as frequently as it could be, uh, healthcare uh, have surprisingly uh, hold quite large percentages of the amount of traffic that we've seen cumulatively over the last eight months. Uh, the top industries kind of fluctuate, as we can see, uh, from the last two to three months, or every two or three months they fluctuate but higher education is almost always on top. So um, this means um, students who have uh, free electricity and, and free internet in their dormitories are, are running mi mining rigs. Um, and so this can be costly for educational institutions. Uh, looking at the kind of geo-distribution of the traffic, uh, we see a lot happening in the US and in European countries um, as far as crypto mining uh, goes that is malicious in nature. Um, not necessarily global crypto mining traffic. Um, and as you can see here, we've got a, a bar chart of a couple of uh, the different country codes that we see quite a bit of traffic in. Um, so you may ask yourself, um, what type of uh, company is most targeted for crypto mining activity? Uh, and I would say that it, it predominantly is focused on smaller businesses or medium-sized businesses. Uh, and, and the reason for this is generally those businesses do not have dedicated uh, incident responders, people who are monitoring network traffic, making sure things are actually um, consistently working as they should. Uh, and so that is why we see normally companies, 10,000 employees or less, are being targeted for this type of activity. Um, we can also see that uh, with, with the use of mining pools um, for, you know, Monero and some other types of coins that you can mine, uh, the market fluctuations in value and the difficulty of the mining can actually impact um, whether or not you're seeing that traffic in your environment. So when the market is down and the mining difficulty is high, uh, you will see less, you'll be less at risk for this type of activity in your environment. But um, when the market cap is, is going up and uh, we're approaching one trillion uh, in market cap, you're going to see a lot more crypto mining in your environment because it is uh, cheaper to, to operate and more lucrative. Um, and we've also seen that as the market has taken a dip uh, recently in overall value for cryptocurrencies, we see a lot more phishing. Um, so, so mining costs, you think, uh, okay, you might ask, well, how much does this really cost uh, malicious actors to, to mine in my environment? Um, and really, the cost is, is pretty negligible. Uh, using popular uh, web miners like uh, CoinHive, or there, there are several that you could use. Uh, generally, they'll take maybe 30% of whatever you mined as, as a fee, uh, and then the rest of it they can put in their pocket. Um, and then the upfront cost of them getting this mining um, 
software, uh, whether it's JavaScript or physical malware software in your environment, is really just the cost of however long it takes uh, their time and money to get into your environment. Um, so this is this is CoinHive, very popular um, online miner. Uh, it mines Monero. And here we can see that uh, really it's not necessarily just larger uh, corporations and servers and AWS instances that are being targeted. We see this happening in smartphones. Um, we see it on websites as JavaScript exploits uh, and then individual machine targeting. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of news stories about different breaches and hacks. Um, some are in cloud AWS instances uh, with basically weak uh, Kubernetes passwords, right? Uh, but we also see um, malicious actors infiltrating sites that deliver content like um, video, uh, as well as uh, news websites where they know that the user is going to be on that domain for at least 30 minutes to an hour consuming content. Uh, that way they maximize the amount of money they're making per machine. Um, so here's an example of a え、こちらの例はジャバスクリプトのインジェクションであります。え、これ非常に簡単なものであります。もう本の数行のコードになっております。え、で、ではこれでもうすでにビジネスをスタートできるわけです。え、このフォーレットを保証しいくつかのパネ
blessed uh, with the HTTPS tag, and um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're safe, so don't uh, rely on um, HTTPS as, as a means of safety. And then here's just a, uh, another example of uh, DuckDuckGo, another popular search engine. So to, to drive this point uh, home a little forward, uh, I'm going to talk about how easy it is to make a Google advertisement uh, to get people um, fished. And this could be, this doesn't necessarily just apply to um, cryptocurrency or uh, crypto phishing. It could be applied to any phishing vector. It's, it's very, very effective. Uh, so a couple of things to note about uh, Google AdWords specifically. Um, you have to, uh, basically the, the redirect does not happen in the ad. Um, the, if you click on an ad in Google, uh, it has to, the, the domain that's registered here has to be part of the landing page that the user ends up on. So you uh, have to own it or at least reference it. Um, and then the domain that's displayed in an ad cannot have a different site name. Uh, so essentially, it, you would have to create a subdirectory or another page on that site to do phishing. So that's what I've done here. I've, I've hidden it and I've put uh, uh, wallet slash I'm going to fish you. Uh, so in this use case, uh, this specific one, I would, as a malicious actor, have to somehow infiltrate and get login credentials for uh, blockchain.info, uh, which would not be a very easy task by any means. Um, but what I could do uh, is I could also set up a phishing campaign to get um, someone who works at blockchain.info uh, who operates their Google AdWords account. Um, and, I, and I hope if I can get their login information for Google AdWords um, that it may also be the same credentials for um, their site and I can then have um, the uh, website uh, who's legitimate pay for ads that are malicious um, and I can have the redirect page to my phishing site to get credentials um, living on blockchain.info as a, as a subdirectory. Um, so you, you have to be careful uh, because malicious actors will take at least two or three different steps out as far as possible phishing vectors in order to get uh, credentials and they're hoping that you're using the same um, credentials for multiple sites. Uh, so here's an example of, uh, of the puny code um, being used uh, heavily in, in Google AdWords and other ad sites. Um, here the, the I is not quite right, um, and that's how it actually is displayed um, when you look up the domain, but of course web browsers try to clean up those types of things for users. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, cryptocurrency exchanges and, and altcoins. Uh, so uh, we discussed before about uh, phishing scams, um, so uh, here are some advertisements for there, but we also see a lot of uh, things happening on social um, networks uh, and communication platforms. This is something um, that was mentioned uh, by Philip uh, at Coinbase yesterday. Uh, it's very easy to uh, entice some um, people, if you send me uh, 0 0.2 Ethereum, I'll give you 2 Ethereum, just because um, me as Binance, I, I love you uh, as a customer, right? Um, this doesn't work for the majority of people, but it, it still works for some, and this is uh, still lucrative enough for them to walk away with quite a bit of, of funds. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Binance. Uh, quick raise of hands, anybody here uh, use Binance as a trading platform? All right, we've got one. All right. Got a few in the audience. Good. I love I love Binance as a trading platform. Um, it's it's very simple to use, easy to manage. They have a lot of uh, security measures in place to keep you from being fished um, or sending funds to wallets that uh, that are not yours or you don't want them to be sent to. So right here we have an example uh, on the left of a malicious site and on the right the legitimate site. Um, the only difference being is that there happens to be a V uh, in the domain name uh, on the one on the left. Uh, which is, of course, uh, malicious. The infrastructure uh, and, and how the malicious actor set this website um, was quite good. All of the stock information uh, updates at the exact same time. If you were to click on any of the links on the phishing site um, that would lead you to logging in within one or two clicks, they would keep you on the phishing site. If you were to look at wikis or 
um, support or information about uh, contests, they would forge you to the legitimate site. Um, and, and they did this so they didn't have to replicate the full infrastructure of the website. So let's pretend that I was not paying attention and I, I'm gonna log into this phishing site. Um, so I, I, I go to the login page, I put in my email and my password, uh, I do a little CAPTCHA, um, and then you say, but wait, Austin, what about uh, two-factor authentication? Um, that, that'll probably save you here, right? Um, not, not necessarily. Um, so this is what is known as a 2FA two, uh, two bypass uh, or a, a man-in-the-middle attack. Um, so I am, I'm the victim, and uh, I am on a phishing site, uh, one of the ones we were just looking at. I uh, give him my credentials. He forwards that to the legitimate website, puts them in. The legitimate website uh, prompts for a two-factor authentication code. Um, that is sent to me, uh, and I don't know. I still don't know that I'm on the wrong site. Uh, I put that information into the phishing site, and then the malicious actor uses that code in order to get into my account. Um, and then normally after that, they forward you to um, the actual website to make it seem like there was just a login glitch. So you have no idea that you actually just gave someone else access um, to your account. And uh, most of the time, they actually do not um, immediately steal your funds. So if we look a little bit more closely at uh, bivnance.com, the malicious domain uh, that we were looking at, uh, using a tool that we have called Investigate, um, we can look at information, uh, who is information, and uh, some other information as well, um, that gives us insight into is this actually legitimate or not, or who, who is doing this. Um, so in this case, we see that uh, the register name uh, is the Center for Ukrainian Internet Names. Um, Binance does not operate <laughs> in Ukraine in, at, at the time, um, and so this is very suspicious. Uh, the email registration, black13 at unseen.is, um, this is a this is an email that prides itself on anonymity and uh, is not what you would ever think a large exchange would use as their email registration email. So there are a lot of red flags here, okay? Uh, and then what also is interesting is the IP that this domain is hosted on is not an IP that Binance uses um, for hosting their infrastructure. So uh, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into, well, well who is this black 13 unseen uh, at unseen.is? What's interesting is that you can see that they're also interested in my Ether wallet. Um, so not only are they wanting to get credentials for your exchange, but they also wanna get um, credentials for online wallets where you think your funds are actually secure. Um, but maybe not if you, if you end up getting fished. Uh, and, and down here you can see uh, a lot of other domains that they have set up uh, at varying stages trying to pretend to be Binance. Um, so some are live, uh, some are uh, prepping to, to go live and to, to fit, uh, for phishing sites. Um, so, so now altcoins, now, now that we have all this stuff about phishing, um, this is where it kind of gets really cool and very scary. Uh, so another tactic they use uh, is it involves pump and dumps. So it is the... Um, you're pumping the price of a coin, and then you um, sell all of your coins uh, at the top, and you use a bunch of other people's funds. So what the malicious actors did was they, they fished uh, a couple of hundred exchange accounts, and then they created trading API keys, and then they didn't do anything for like a month or two. Uh, and then they set up a bot to automatically trade all of, uh, to basically liquidate all of the coins that were in those wallets into Bitcoin and then use that to purchase um, Viacoin. And the reason they chose Viacoin was because the liquidity of Viacoin was only about 11 and a half Bitcoin. So that means it was very easy for uh, the actor to buy the whole order book, um, all asks, all bids, uh, which essentially would allow them to increase the value of that coin by 10,000%. Um, so if, and what they did is they had a couple accounts that they had their own Viacoin uh, holdings in that they had procured before and uh, just lied in wait and were going to sell their own holdings at the top and walk away um, with about $32 million. Um, but un unfortunately for them, uh, it didn't happen. Uh, the exchanges noticed that uh, a 10,000% increase in any asset is very unusual and <laughs> they, they basically blocked um, withdrawals and deposits for, that f um, for those funds. So they didn't 
it impacted individuals and the fact that they, they lost um, a lot of their asset value when their funds were liquidated, um, but the malicious actor didn't walk away with any uh, of the money. But if um, the exchanges did not have some of those security measures in place, uh, which is the case of a lot of small exchanges, um, they don't have uh, halting on trading for huge jumps in asset prices, um, they could have walked away with a lot of money. Uh, so now that I've talked a lot about uh, well, crypto phishing and crypto jack, I want to talk a smidge more about how you can protect yourself um, with, with different tools. Uh, so DNS level identification of, of uh, crypto mining uh, and crypto jacking is, is very, very effective. So looking through your DNS query logs um, to see if things like CoinHive and other um, mining pools like uh, XMR uh, miner pools .xyz is a, a very popular one. Um, you can see if any of your machines and your environments are, are querying these, and then you can uh, know that, okay, well, either an employee went to a, uh, a website that was has a JavaScript exploit and mined a bit of currency, or maybe there's a piece of software in my environment that is mining that I need to look into. Um, for, for cloud computing instances, um, and this was, this was mentioned before in one of the uh, previous talks, uh, look for increases in utilization of, of CPU for your ADA, AWS um, instances. They would normally only do 10 or 15 percent um, increase in utilization so that when you get your bill, it doesn't seem, it seems higher than normal, but it's not too high. Um, and so that they want to basically operate for as long in your environment as they can uh, without being caught or identified. Um, and they're also hoping that as long, the longer they wait, the value of that currency goes up considerably. Uh, so, so one of the models um, that we use at uh, Umbrella is the uh, co-currence model. And so it's kind of like um, guilty by association. So if, if we know that one website is malicious um, and we look at the, the time that other sites were visited, basically 15 seconds before or after, um, we can basically say, okay, that, that seems a little suspicious if, if all of the users that are forwarding their DNS to our service uh, are ex going to the exact same domains within a certain time frame of each other. That's uh, suspicious. Uh, and so what we can do is uh, look at, uh, once it's crossed the statistic threshold of, of number of people who are doing the exact same behavior, then we can say, okay, this is very unusual. We should look into this and see if it's also malicious. Um, the same thing can be done for legitimate websites. Um, so I had mentioned CoinHive uh, previously, uh, which is, by the way, totally legitimate. Um, we see misuse of CoinHive, um, a lot of misuse of CoinHive, but it is, in fact, a legitimate service. It's just the way that people are, are using it and whether or not they're notifying people um, that they are using their resources to mine currency. So w with CoinHive, uh, we can see uh, a lot of co-occurrences with uh, the websites. The behavior is similar. Uh, so we have a lot of malicious domains that are uh, associated with uh, phishing and browser redirects um, from other legitimate sites. We also see domains that have uh, JavaScript injections that are running miners while people are consuming content. Uh, and then we've got um, some other mining scripts where uh, essentially malicious actors are posing to be CoinHive and um, getting you to install software or put it on your website, but hard code um, their wallet address. So you basically set up CoinHive thinking you're going to make some money, but you're really just sending it to somebody else. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, our team at Cisco Umbrella um, has worked on, uh, I wanna give a shout out for um, Jeremiah O'Connor and Artsum, two of my colleagues. Um, they developed this uh, classifier that's very effective in identifying uh, phishing traffic. Um, so we start with domains that uh, we, we've never seen before, we've never resolved, uh, and we use Apache Spark uh, in order to come up with the, the basis of this model. So we'll do uh, an FQDN uh, classification on the, the page. We'll, we'll pull the source code of the first page of the domain, uh, and then we'll start looking at HTML content classification. Uh, and then we'll look to see, okay, now that we know what this looks like and have a general feeling, um, is this being hosted on infrastructure that we know is legitimate? Uh, is, it a, is it a really good IP? Is it a good ASN? Or is it in some shady place um, in Ukraine or, or elsewhere? Uh, and then we can do blocking and threat intelligence once we've uh, gone through that. Um, going a little bit deeper, uh, we can see that 
we're basically breaking this out into four steps where we, we have DNS queries coming in. Uh, we check to see if the information of that site is listed on something that we know and we trust. Uh, and then we will basically do uh, a check uh, on the page to see, okay, is this page that we've never seen before but looks similar to something we have seen? Does it have a, uh, a box to input credentials uh, or something like that? Uh, and then we will basically create a, a TF IDF. Um, so this is basically just uh, NLP uh, modeling, so natural language processing. Uh, and then we'll do some latent semantic analysis and then we'll take the uh, cosine of the new site that we just saw with the site that we know is actually legitimate. Uh, and then we'll basically train the data set uh, in order to identify uh, domains that are good or bad um, moving forward. Um, so here's a little bit simpler version of it. We'll, we'll go look at all of the exchanges that we know are legitimate. We'll download the code from the site. Um, we'll create a, a score. And then we will, uh, whenever we see a new site that seems similar, we will create uh, a corpus document and we'll compare it. Uh, and this will allow us to determine if this is a phishing site uh, for a, an exchange without ever having to look at it. Um, so here, here's one such example. This is uh, lcoinbase.com. Um, it has a score of uh, 99.4. Uh, and we can see here some other suspicious things like um, Coinbase would never have their uh, email registration at a, a Hotmail account. <laughs> and that's, they, they would never do that. Um, so we know that this is suspicious. And um, here, here is the live site, uh, which at the time looked just like Coinbase's um, website, but it actually is in fact malicious. So one thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, the criminal organizations that are behind these type of attacks are, are using several different revenue vectors. They're not just going to try to fish your credentials. Um, they're also going to run ransomware campaigns, and they're also going to try, uh, try to install crypto mining software in your environment. Um, it, it's, it's very profitable, it's pretty anonymous, uh, and that's why they choose to do all of these different uh, vectors for, for making money. Uh, one such case that we, we found and, and highlighted a couple of months back um, was uh, just purely phishing, uh, crypto phishing of wallets. Um, they actually, in two months time, made almost uh, $2 million USD uh, so it's, it's very lucrative for these malicious actors. Uh, and then going to the flip side, ransomware, um, we, see, we see a lot of ransomware still. Um, ransomware was a little bit riskier of a business before when you had to have infrastructure to process uh, credit card transactions. Um, but with the, the invention of uh, cryptocurrency, much easier uh, to make payments, uh, more anonymous, and you're less likely to get caught. Um, and so I, I think cryptocurrencies invention uh, definitely helped propel ransomware to be as much of a problem as it, as it was and, and still is. Um, so for, for ransomware infections, normally you would get infected, right? Uh, you would be encrypted and then you would respond to the incident. Um, you would restore from a backup if you had it, uh, but if you didn't, you would make a decision whether or not, okay, I have to have my data, I should pay, uh, or no, I don't care, I'm not going to pay, um, I'll just lose the data. Um, but let's say that you have to get it, uh, you end up paying, and then you keep the rest of the cryptocurrency you have in storage just in case something like that um, happens again. Um, so now I'm gonna wrap it up with a, a couple of final thoughts, and then I'll open it up for questioning. Um, so point number one, uh, we're, we're really witnessing a, a huge restructuring uh, in the criminal economy as far as uh, cryptocurrency is, is concerned. Um, this new digital digital asset has really opened up a lot of uh, vectors for malicious actors to spread more um, in infrastructure and, and hit more people. Uh, luckily, there are you know any money any money laundering laws now where if you move more than one Bitcoin into fiat, um, so yen, USD, um, euro, you have to give so a certain level of information that will allow you to be tracked. Um, uh, but what uh, criminals have figured out is that uh, they, with these laws, they have millions of dollars in cryptocurrency that they can't do anything with because um, it's very hard to get into fiat without being noticed. Uh, and so what they've been doing is buying property 
uh, and, and things like that to try to um, get into an asset and then sell that asset and then get uh, fiat. Uh, second, uh, individuals are uh, in crypto tax are a much softer target. Uh, if I was a hacker, I would much rather go after someone who just started trading cryptocurrencies, even if they only have $15,000 invested, than going after a financial institution that has a lot of security measures um, and that, that have been around for a long time. Uh, so when you're, you're trading in, uh, if you decide to trade in crypto assets, um, really take your own security to heart uh, because you are your own bank and you need to have your own security measures. Uh, the third thought, um, there have been some recent shutdowns of the very popular exchanges that were being used to uh, basically dry um, uh, and exchange Bitcoin and other assets um, in a way that kind of money laundered it. Um, and they've decided to shift away from doing it this way and focus on targeting those smaller businesses that we talked about before that maybe don't have such a great security posture. Uh, and then and the last thing that I want to, um, to leave with is uh, protecting your environment is it's hard, right? There are always going to be new attacks that you have to deal with, but uh, looking at your DNS query logs is a really good first step um, when you know that a specific attack has to make a request, uh, a DNS request. So it's a very good way of identifying um, if you might have a problem. Um, but, but don't just look for uh, web-based miners, so don't just go look for CoinHive in your, um, your logs, right? You also want to look for uh, software-based miners like um, HoneyMiner that are running in your environment because they can be a possible indicator that someone externally has installed software in your environment. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to open it up for questions.